thank you for taking the time to watch this video on the role of steroids and anti-inflammatories. This is one of the most common questions that we receive, and because the answer is fairly long and complicated, uh, we thought we'd make a video specifically addressing the topic. Now in this video, we're gonna review five things. Number one, uh, what are steroids and anti-inflammatories? Number two, why do some suggest them after reversal? Number three, are there any data which suggests that they actually work? Number four, what are the side effects? And number five, should I take them? So, proceeding with number one, what are steroids and anti-inflammatories? Well, steroids include glucocorticoids, such as prednisone, medrol, or other similar types of drugs. Now, your body naturally produces these from the adrenal gland in cases of stress or injury, but they're normally at very low levels in the body. The drug works to suppress your immune system, which then cuts down on inflammation. Now, when given for medical purposes, they're most often used in cases of severe or life-threatening allergies, asthma attacks, as part of a cancer treatment regimen, or with immune system disorders. Now, anti-inflammatory drugs are a completely different class of medication and are usually used as temporary pain relievers. Uh, these drugs include ibuprofen, Aleve, aspirin, Excedrin, or others in that same class. Now, they're considered NSAIDs, which means non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. In other words, they're an anti-inflammatory that is not a steroid, like prednisone. Uh, they also function to impair the body's inflammation pathway, which is how they help to reduce pain. So number two, why do some suggest to use steroids or NSAIDs after reversal? Well, there are basically three causes of failures after a vasectomy reversal. Uh, the first is that the wrong surgery was done in the first place. Uh, as an example, if you needed an epididymal vasostomy but received a vasovasostomy, it'll automatically fail at the outset. Number two, the repair pulls apart. Now we have greatly reduced the likelihood for this with the revast technique, as well as counseling to limit activities for eight weeks post-op. Or number three, the area of repair scars down after surgery. Now this third one is the specific reason that steroids are used. Now after surgery, your body will constantly try to heal the wound, and it does so through three different processes, inflammation, proliferation, and maturation. Inflammation is the early process where your body's immune system fights off bacteria and brings in cells to help repair blood vessels and other tissues. Now in contrast to what you may uh, hear otherwise, inflammation is not a bad thing, but is an essential component of healing. Proliferation is at this stage where your body then begins to strengthen the areas that were previously operated on. Uh, during this stage, your body lays down new collagen, which is like the rebar of the body. This provides additional strength and begins as early as three days after surgery. Now this is an absolutely necessary step, otherwise the wound would open up and the repair would just tear apart. And finally, maturation. This is the stage where your body is continually revising the scar tissue over and over again. Now, maturation will typically go on for years, and you can compare this whole process with the last time that you accidentally cut your skin. In the first week after the cut, the area becomes red, warm, and tender, and this is the period of inflammation. And during the next week, you develop a scab on the area, and the wound begins to heal, and that is the stage of proliferation. Once the scab falls off, the skin is basically closed, but it's not done healing. Uh, as the next few months pass, the scar becomes bigger and redder and more noticeable, and then over a period of several months and years, it becomes smaller and less noticeable. Now, the exact same process occurs within the vas deferens. Within the first week of surgery, the body begins a process of inflammation to heal the area. During the next few weeks, proliferation is occurring and the body is strengthening the repair. Then, during the maturation phase, the scar initially becomes thicker and more robust, and this is probably why sperm counts decline during this period in most cases. As the scar becomes thicker, it reduces the size of the opening, and this can go on for several months. Uh, in many cases, with additional time, the scar will become less thick, and the opening will again allow free passage of sperm. Now, in some cases, as the opening narrows, it may fully close and stay permanently closed. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way of knowing if someone will only temporarily close or permanently close. Now, you may often hear people or doctors say that inflammation is leading to reduced sperm counts. This isn't technically correct in the far majority of cases, as it's not inflammation specifically, but rather the normal process of wound remodeling that is leading to the change in scar tissue. Now, if someone takes steroids, such as prednisone or medrol, depending when they're taken, it can impact one or more of the phases of wound healing. So, that leads us to the next question, which is, do steroids actually work? Well, the short answer is, maybe, and sort of. So, 
please keep in mind that this information is up to date as of the posting of this video, but medical research changes quickly. Uh, so let's review the available published studies to dive into this a little bit more deeply. The earliest known study on this topic was performed in dogs, and in the study the investigators performed a vasovasostomy on both sides of each dog in a total of eight dogs. Half of the dogs were then treated with a very high dose of prednisone for two weeks, and the others weren't. Uh, Twelve weeks later, the investigators cut out the area of repair and analyzed it. Uh, one of the tests they did was to shoot fluid across the area to see if it was still open. Uh, overall, the results showed that three of seven of the control animals were still open, while five of eight of the prednisone animals were open. Now, the results were not statistically significant between the two, uh, but the second test they did was to take small cuts of the area to evaluate how much scar tissue had actually formed. Now, thankfully, the people analyzing the samples were not aware which group the dogs were in originally. In this part of the study, the investigators found no difference between either group, suggesting that there was no final difference in the amount of scar tissue that developed. This also suggested that if steroids had any benefit, it did not appear to keep the benefit long term. Now, a later study was published in an obscure journal in 1980. In this study, a retrospective look was performed comparing 40 men who had vasovasostomy procedures over a period of several years. Uh, 20 of the men were treated without steroids, while 20 were treated with prednisone, 40 milligrams daily for six weeks, followed by a tapering of the medication. Now, please note this dose is far higher than is considered appropriate ethically today. Now, it's not clear how long the patients were followed, but it was typically not much longer than six months per the report. Overall, the author reported that 70% of men in the non-steroid group were found to have sperm, compared to 95% in the prednisone arm. Pregnancy rates were 45% in the non-prednisone arm, compared to 55% in the prednisone one. Now, the difference in sperm counts was statistically different, but the pregnancy rates were not. Now, the sperm counts in men who were treated with prednisone decreased continually after the prednisone was discontinued. There are a few issues with this study, though. First, this appears to be a fairly low volume surgeon as the 40 cases were performed over a period of several years. Second, the cases were not randomized. Basically, the surgeon compared his later outcomes to his earlier ones. Now, the problem with that is surgeons are continually improving their technique and just in their uh, surgical ability overall. So it's very likely that the improved outcomes were just as likely due to his overcoming the learning curve of the procedure as much as anything else. It's also very common for high volume vas reversal surgeons to have a 90 plus percent success rate in finding sperm with or without the use of prednisone. Uh, the definition used for sperm was the presence of any sperm seen at any time. And we've previously published that this is a hugely inadequate uh, definition. Uh, also in the study, the doses are much higher than are used today. And even the authors themselves concluded that while this effect could be prolonged by continuing steroid administration for a longer period, the side effects of steroids after six to eight weeks become a hazard, which would be difficult to justify. And finally, a third, more recent study was published in the Canadian Journal of Urology in April of 2020. In this study, the authors performed a review of 89 men who underwent reversals over a 10-year period and received steroids for low or declining sperm counts. Men were treated with 20 mg daily for two weeks, followed by 10 mg daily for two weeks. Overall, the authors found that following the course of steroids, total modal sperm counts increased by about 10 million. Uh, men who had some amount of sperm in general did better than those who had a zero count. These results would suggest a possible benefit with prednisone, particularly in men who still have sperm in the ejaculate. The improvements only persist while patients remained on the steroids, and there are still several limitations of the study. Uh, one of these limitations is a very uh, small number, it was nine patients per year, and there really wasn't a true comparison against a control group. Because of the lack of a true control group, this type of study would generally be classified as a four on the level of the evidence scale, where one is the highest and five is the lowest. So it's intriguing, uh, but definitely not conclusive. Now jumping uh, to the topic of NSAIDs, uh, unfortunately there's less to discuss here. Uh, there are currently no studies which have evaluated the efficacy of NSAIDs in men post-reversal. Uh, some have used NSAIDs for other applications, and in these studies, the data are mixed. As an example, no guidelines currently recommend the use of NSAIDs chronically to reduce scarring in any disease state. Uh, some studies have shown reduced decline in function for people with chronic recurrent infectious processes, such as cystic fibrosis, but not in cases of scarring that were not due to infection, such as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. 
In other words, NSAIDs do reduce inflammation, but there's no evidence that they reduce remodeling, which is really the main process that is occurring with delayed scarring with reversals. So what are the side effects of steroids and NSAIDs? Steroids such as prednisone or medrol have a large number of side effects, including thinning of the bones, which is known as osteoporosis, eye problems such as glaucoma and cataracts, high blood pressure, diabetes, increased risk for infection, anxiety, difficulty sleeping, stomach ulcers or reflux, puffy face with water retention, a development of a buffalo hump, and, and many more. Well, how often do people actually experience these side effects though? That's a tough question to answer as it completely depends on the dose given, the total time administered, the patient's underlying age, and their health status. A medium to high dose is usually defined as 7.5 milligrams daily or above. Now a recent study in men who took 40 milligrams of prednisone for five days showed that 50% of these men had worsening of high blood sugars, while 7% had worsening of blood pressure. Now these are generally considered mild side effects, but in a more recent study in the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, they reported the rate of more severe complications. In this study, 2.6 million men who took short bursts of steroids were evaluated. Results showed that there was a 3% chance of developing a significant gastrointestinal bleed over a one-year treatment period and a less than 1% chance of heart failure or severe life-threatening infections. In other words, the risks with steroids depends completely on the dose and duration taken. Uh, most men will experience some side effect, which is usually not noticeable, and a very small percentage will develop a more severe reaction. Now, these risks are increased if the total duration of steroids is extended. In contrast, the risk of NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, are generally less than those of corticosteroids. Uh, the main concern with longer-term use of NSAIDs is the increased risk of stomach ulcers or gastrointestinal or GI bleeds. Uh, longer term, NSAIDs can lead to kidney failure and an increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. However, this usually requires a, a long duration of use, uh, such as over years. And finally, should I take steroids or NSAIDs? Well, this is a difficult question to answer, and it'll be different for each individual and really should be discussed with your physician. Uh, the decision to pursue any treatment is based on reviewing the potential risks versus the benefits. Now, on the upside, it may increase sperm counts. On the downside, it likely only improves counts while it's being taken, doesn't improve outcomes long term, there's inconclusive data, and the optimal regimen has not been defined, and there is a potential for significant and cumulative side effects, particularly if you take them over an extended period of time. Now, regarding NSAIDs, uh, the risks are far lower but the potential for improvements is also far lower. So, in general, our position has been that if a patient wants us to prescribe the steroids and they don't have any health conditions which would preclude it, such as a gastrointestinal disorder or diabetes, then we're happy to prescribe them. Uh, but we always want to make sure that the patients understand the potential risks and benefits so they're making as informed a decision as possible. Now, if steroids are used, ideally they should be used as soon as motility declines. And the problem there is that it's often very difficult to identify the point where it declines without obtaining tests on a weekly basis. Also, there's an expected drop in counts from the two week to the four and six week time points as the body washes out the backlogged sperm. So it's not clear if this period should be treated or not. Now, as far as NSAIDs, if the patient does not have any reason that they can't take them, we generally recommend them as a first line agent until pain is resolved. We hope this video has been helpful uh, if you have any additional questions after viewing this video, uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, via email or phone, and we'd be more than happy to address them. Thank you very much.